Hello, Ty. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Chris. I hope you're well. I hope your family's well and you're staying productive during this very strange time we're in. I am, and, and you too. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ty, you've been doing insurance work for uh, a good long time, I think probably close to 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I know you have gone through a lot of what we would consider the, the, the prior disasters, you know, hurricanes and, and earthquakes and fires and 9-11 and all that other stuff that have uh, kind of uh, kept us on our toes over the last few years. But this is, this is a unique situation. Um, and I guess I'd like to talk with you about what you see are some of the issues as a result of uh, the COVID-19 epidemic and all of the things that it's had and the effects that it's had on our lives. Let's come back in a few minutes to possible solutions, because it sounds like you've spent some time thinking about that as well, which I think will be very interesting to talk about. I want to continue on where you started, where you listed categories of claims. Now, we've talked about some of the really interesting questions dealing with those first party insurance claims that we were that we, that we were talking about. Um, but you raised other kinds of claims, things like uh, officers and directors liability, uh, broker liability, et cetera. Can you say a few words about how you see that developing? Yeah, I mean, outside of, of, of coverage disputes, and, and right. again, we, we mentioned one and there are, there are others like general liability and, and whatnot, any other types of coverage, coverage litigation that I'm going to see. Um, let's talk about directs as an office of liability. So let's talk about two, two types there. Um, first, let's talk about non-coverage uh, issues associated with directors and officers liability. And then we can mention some of the coverage issues that I see with directors and officers liability. Um, there has been at least uh, the last time I looked, which was uh, uh, about four months ago, uh, well over 100 cases against directors and officers uh, alleging uh, their liability, and, and again, these and O's have personal liability for mismanagement of the companies that they run uh, arising out of COVID-19. Um, many of these cases are against publicly traded companies, uh, or these and O's, I should say, of uh, publicly traded companies um, alleging uh, non-disclosure um, in violation of the securities laws. Uh, let me just give you a few. These are all the ones that have sort of hit the news. Uh, you know, as a result of COVID-19, uh, many of us have been using Zoom. In fact, we're using Zoom for this, for this interview, right? Right. Um, and um, we've uh, heard at the beginning that, that Zoom had some uh, securities issues uh, that they had to uh, take care of and they had to increase uh, their level of encryption. Uh, and they did that. But before they did that, what many people uh, don't know is that they got sued uh, by their shareholders for uh, not disclosing, allegedly, their less than adequate, this is according to their shareholders, uh, right. level of encryption. Um, so when the news came up uh, of the so-called Zoom bombing and other privacy concerns, um, organizations started prohibiting Zoom usage, um, and the stock price of Zoom plummeted. That caused damage, of course, to the shareholders, and they alleged uh, a violation of 10b-5 and 20a of the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934. Um, other uh, shareholder actions against publicly traded companies uh, that have hit the news is there was a pharmaceutical company that I won't name that allegedly told Trump that they could get a vaccine in three hours. Obviously, that wasn't true. Uh, so when that came out as being untrue, their stock dropped. They were sued. Um, there was a, a company that uh, allegedly disclosed that they could get a big supply of N95 masks. When that came out that that wasn't true, they got sued. And then, of course, there was the uh, cruise company uh, Cruz, uh, that um, was sued for uh, not disclosing that they were uh, uh, aware of the virus um, and didn't tell anybody about it until, uh, until uh, afterwards. Um, they delayed it by, uh, I forget how long, actually, it could have been only a few days, but it doesn't really matter. 
Um, so there was, there's been many, many suits against directors and officers uh, by shareholders, um, against publicly traded companies, and, and ones against privately held companies as well. Let's go back a little bit closer to the directly to insurance. Uh, as you were describing this, I'm thinking to myself, what kind of liability do agents and brokers and people who may have helped sell these policies or help place these policies potentially have? You know, that is, I think, one of the largest category of insurance-related litigation that we're going to see. Um, because at the end of the day, if a big percentage of these business interruption cases and these other cases go against the policyholders, um, and there are many, as I mentioned, uh, besides business interruption that are going to be coverage issues. Um, if a big percentage of those against, goes against the policyholders, policyholders are going to start blaming their brokers, right? And they're going to say their brokers should have sold them coverage uh, of policies that covered these things, right? Um, and there are, go there are both defenses and vulnerabilities. So, um, not to get too geeky here, uh, but uh, so here's the good news and the bad news. So, uh, the, the good news is that the law is generally on the side of brokers, which is as a general matter, uh, and I'll take New York as an example, because I'm a New York uh, lawyer, but again, I'm an expert witness, as you know, so I speak from the point of view of custom and practice. Right. Um, but in New York, uh, general agents really just have a duty to obtain the coverage that the clients ask them to. That's it. They have to obtain that coverage, which in a reasonable time, and inform their client if they can't obtain the coverage. They don't have a duty to advise or guide or direct the client. Uh, they are not the personal financial advisors. Um, they don't guarantee coverage. They're basically order takers. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that almost every broker I know does not project themselves that way. Because you project them th yourself that way, you don't get a lot of business. Right. Okay? Most brokers I know don't go to the client and say, listen, I, I don't really know anything. You tell me what you want, and then I'll get it for you. That's it. Tell me what you want, right? That's not the way to make a lot of money in this life. So most brokers, directly or indirectly, give the impression to clients that they actually know what they're doing, <laughs> that they are a risk advisor. And the problem with that is that when you go down that road, you develop what many courts call a special relationship. And when you develop a special relationship, you start having duties to actually be the person that you say that you are. <laughs> and then you get in trouble. The other way you get in trouble is there's a natural inclination to want to help your client. So if the client says to you, I have, you know, I I'm losing money. I I'm, I'm shut down. You got to do something. There's a natural inclination to say to the client, don't worry. I'll figure this thing out. You're going to be okay. Now, every lawyer will tell you this is a dumb thing to say. People say it anyway. Because you want to help. Because if you don't help, the person's going to run away. This gets you in trouble. So in the real world, <laughs> brokers say a lot of things that are going to get them in suit. In addition to that, there are and has been since 2013 standalone insurance policies that cover the very thing that people want. Very few people have bought them. But that doesn't mean they weren't available. And that doesn't mean that a broker that really did his due diligence or her due diligence wouldn't have found them. So there's an argument 
that a broker that pro projects themselves as saying, I can help you get the coverage that you really need, which would include coverage for business interruption arising out of viruses, could actually have found that coverage. Now, it was very expensive. The client might have said no. But now the, now the client is going to say, you didn't even tell me it existed. And by the way, I found out it actually did exist. You didn't give me the option to say no. 